and start this. So the plan for today is to get started with uh, the creation of a uh, well ontology. So right now you see uh, RDF, you have seen uh, linked open data, you have seen basic idea and structure of uh, a well language, a well specification. Today we try to have the, a more practical step that is how to build for real, let's say, an ontology in a well with the tool that we have at hand. Um, and so this brief presentation is mainly on the process, one of the process, one of the possible process to build up an ontology from scratch in a domain of choice. And the three hours for today are ideally split in one hour and a half, and me that spoke with you, and uh, in an interactive way, I, have some, I will have some questions for you, so be prepared. And the other, then we have a break, and the other hour and a half, uh, there is the last exercise, the third one, that will last around one hour, one hour and a half, you have one hour, one hour and a half to complete the exercise, and it will be a mix of what you see, uh, what you have seen last, uh, on Monday, and what I present today. The slides for these are already uh, on the web and also printed here. So uh, just two or three slides to recap. You have seen this on Monday, so it's fresh in your mind, probably. So what is a well two? A well two is a knowledge representation language designed to formulate, exchange, and reason with knowledge about a domain of interest. Let me stress this, a domain of interest. And an ontology is always related to a specific domain of interest. I will repeat this very a lot, a lot of time during today, so please forgive me. The bas basic notion of a well is that you have axioms, entities, and expressions. Axioms are the basic statement that the ontology express, entities are elements that are refer referred to real world object, while expression, it's a combination to entities to form a complex uh, the description from basic one. The result of the modeling process in OL is called ontology, as you know. And each uh, knowledge, each piece of knowledge is called also statement or proposition and statement are in, in ontology are called also axiom in a well too. This is just to, to recap things that you already have seen on Monday. Uh, uh, so a statement is a consequence of other statements uh, so that a statement is true when other statements are true and vice versa. A statement, a set of statements that in our case is an ontology, uh, could be consistent or inconsistent, and are consistent if there is a possible state of affairs in which all the statements in the sets are jointly true. So no statement is not true in that set, otherwise it is inconsistent. This check of a consistency, inconsistency in a well, uh, and with the tool that we have, is typically made via reasoner, uh, for the OWL language. Uh, so, again, an ontology, in another definition, is an explicit description of a domain mm -hmm. that consists of concepts, properties, and that attributes of that concepts, event, optional constraint on properties and such attributes, and individuals. Often, do you have individuals in an ontology? Not always. But surely an ontology defines both a common vocabulary and a shared understanding of a specific domain. In our OL2 ontologies, you have all these, these base elements, you have classes, you will have sometimes instances, you have properties, either object properties, 
or data type properties, you have a restriction most of the time, and in a current practice, you also have annotation. How we build and work and maintain an ontology, we typically have two types of tools. This is uh, a slightly updated slide with respect to the other, to what you see on Monday. Um, so from the editors, the most common editor that is used is Protégé. Now in version five, Protégé is built uh, by the Stanford University and is maintained by Stanford University, the bioinformatics group of Stanford University. Uh, that is the most general purpose tool for building ontologies. It's specific for a well, a well too, in particular. Then there are other tools. Mm -hmm. Some of them are free, other are paid, and then you have also special purpose application like friend of a friend editors uh, that are specific to work with the friend of a friend ontology. You, you, you know what is the friend of a friend ontology, yeah. Then on top of this editor, you have typically reasoners, reasoners that are different uh, if they pertain to a different uh, flavor of a well, so for full of well, for a well DL, you have, for example, Pellet, version two, that is quite old, uh, Hermit, that is another reasoner, Fact++, that is a reasoner based on C++, and or Racer Pro, that is a payment option. For other, let's say, dialect of a well, you have other separate reasoner that consist of the reason that perform this consistency, consistency check, and completion check with the specific sub-level, sub-language of, of well. We will use, for today, in this course in general, we will refer always to a well DL, so the most complete language of well, and we will use Hermit as a reasoner today that is included in Protégé, and we'll use Protégé 5. Uh, whatever it is. 5.2. So this is just to recap. Today we speak about uh, the process of building and maintaining an ontology that is called formally ontology engineering. That well is the process of building and maintaining an ontology. Uh, in this ontology in the, in engineer, we typically define concept in a specific domain. We arrange the concept in a hierarchy so sibling, mm -hmm. subclasses, superclass, superclasses, and so on. We define which properties these classes may have and optionally the restriction. And then we define instances, individual, that pertain to these classes and fill the properties of these individual accordingly. So, yeah, yes. So, The first question we, we may ask is why we can develop, develop an ontology. This is a non-serious slide, so please consider this in that way. So why develop an ontology? Option A, you ate your life. Option B, you need to fill several days and weeks and months with something to do or other. Uh, this is uh, not serious, but it's not uh, distant from the reality in the sense that developing an ontology especially a big one is typically a very long process you cannot have dedicate five minutes today and have forgot about it and you have to be very precise and keep track of everything you do you did and refine change your idea change your mind and so on so it took a lot of time typically and since it's quite precise as a process and tools are not, uh, let's say, the most sophisticated tool that we can have, you, at a certain point you can ask why on the hell I'm working on this. So you're a little bit hate, maybe not your life, but uh, the problem at hand for sure. So for example, Protégé doesn't have a copy and paste function. So you build an, an individual, you need to create 10 individuals, well, by hand. Separately, even if they are identical with just the name changed, you have to create it by hand. So Protégé doesn't have a 
copy and paste option. So this is something that uh, say, okay, really? Yes. Uh, the option is to open the OWL file in a text editor and copy and paste portion of uh, the, the, uh, the ontology that you are interested in. And this is something that typically people do <laughs> because it's a lot uh, quicker to copy and paste a portion, but you have to know what are doing because if you copy and paste something not completely or you forgot uh, uh, pieces you typically mess up your ontology and maybe protege is not able anymore to open the ontology at all so you destroy your ontology maybe one month of work for a wrong copy and paste in a text editor so you can revert but it's it's something it's a process that is not uh, easy let's say in that way so real reason to develop an ontology uh, i will present five of them they are quite different so the first reason is to share a common understanding of the structure of information among people you present information and you want to display it to visualize it to people or among software artifacts for example in the sensor domain in the IoT domain, in the energy domain, ontologies are quite useful for exchanging information between software artifact artifacts. Uh, to enable the reuse of a specific domain knowledge, hmm? to avoid reinventing the well every time, or to introduce standards to allow interoperability of different software pieces or also of different uh, data structure. Uh, so for example in the medical uh, field they use quite a lot of ontologies and biolog biology medical field and so you can have an ontology that describes some poor I, I know i know anything about um, i know nothing about uh, medicine and biology but they maybe create a an ontology to describe a certain type of protein and then you can build up on that ontology to uh, create some more protein or something like that. Uh, yeah, you get the idea. Um, then another reason is to make domain assumption explicit. Hmm? You don't have with an, with an ontology implicit domain assumption. You always try to have explicit domain assumption. In that way, it's easier to change such, such assumption. So if you build up some assumption in the domain in an implicit way, uh, you may be, uh, the domain, the, the assumption can change, you have to redo all your work. If these, these uh, assumptions are explicit, you can easily uh, upgrade, update your representation according to the new uh, domain assumption. So it's easier to understand and also update legacy data. It's also useful to separate domain knowledge from operational knowledge. And it's also useful to analyze in, de in depth, uh, some domain knowledge. So you can also use that ontology as a tool for better understand a specific knowledge on a specific domain. So the process of creating an ontology is, can be summarized in this. Hmm? Seven steps here described in a linear way. So the first step is to determine the scope. So what the ontology is about. The second step is to consider the reuse of other ontologies or so other open linked data or RDF structure that already exist to include them in your ontology or just to refer to them or you discover in the second step that already exists an ontology that do whatever you want and so you have finished your work. In any case, typically you go to step three that is enumerate terms, then you define classes you define properties for these classes, you define co uh, constraint, and optionally, uh, in the end, you create instances for your ontology. So, uh, obviously, step four and five are intertwined. You create classes and properties for that classes, and you maybe move uh, back and forth between classes and properties. But in the real world, the process works more or less in this way. It's not so linear. So you determine the scope and then consider the reuse, the enumerate terms, and you say, okay, this term 
open the possibility for other reuse. So you could consider reuse, then you define classes, then you enumerate terms again, and so on. So it's again a quite long process if you build up an ontology uh, entirely, a full ontology. And so it's quite a complex process. And as a disclaimer, I would like to stress that there is no one correct way or methodology for developing an ontology. This is a process, it's a quite common process. It's shared process, but it's not the correct one or the wrong one, typically, or one that uh, give you for sure a perfect and correct ontology. It's most of the work, it's up to you, the creator and the maintainer of ontology, not to mess up things. So creating an ontology, as I, I said before, it's a long, hard and precise activity. Uh, there are three fundamental rules. The first one is there is no one correct way to model a specific domain. And there are always viable alternatives. The best solution depends on what you are interested in, in that domain. So you want to create a domain for visualizing some information, or you want to create an ontology on that domain to build an application on X for that domain. And so according to this change, the depth and the, the spread of an ontology can change, obviously, according to your specific need. Uh, ontology development, as we saw before, is necessarily an iterative process. And the third rule is that concept in the ontology should be close to real object be their physical object, a table, or a logical object, and their relation in your domain of interest. So they represent closely real object, logical or not logical, but real. So this object, uh, this concept are typically to be noun and the relationship verb in sentences that describe a domain. So for example, uh, building up on the example of Monday on the university, uh, we can say that students follow a course and that a teacher teaches a course and in these two sentences we can have that student teaches teachers and course are uh, concept and teaches and follow our properties, our relationship. And we can take this and put this in a real ontology in that way with the same name, if we want, if we want to describe a university. So let's have a look at these seven steps uh, in order. And let's try also to, to build an ontology while we are doing this. So the first step is determine the domain and the scope. So what is the domain of ontology? And for what are we going to use the ontology? And for what type of the question the information of the ontology should provide answer and who will use and maintain the ontology. These are the four bas basic questions to answer in this step. And answer of this question may change during the life cycle of the ontology, especially the last one. So the third step that is for what type of question the information the ontology should provide answer are also called competency question. It is one way to determine the exact scope of the ontology that is write down a list of questions that that knowledge base, uh, the knowledge base built upon the ontology should be able to answer. And this question may also serve a ladder for a preliminary evaluation of the completeness of the, of the ontology you, you build. And question doesn't need to be extensive, complete, but just a sketch of possible question that cover. So in this what's called learning by example, we try to apply this process in, at least in the first iteration. I have chosen a domain that is university. And then we can try to <clears throat> build up the competency question and the perspective, I, I, will, give it, I will give the perspective. So, just also an example of this first step. So the domain is a university, which is the scope. So university could be considered in a lot of way. Could be considered from a student, teacher, educational point of view. 
could be considered from a research point of view. So, so in the university, there are professors that are teaching students, there are postdocs that publish papers in conferences. So all this work could be uh, represented on the uh, administrative point of view. So there are secretary, technician, the, the university buy things, university uh, have some money coming in from public entities, private entities, and so on. So the domain is always university, but it's the perspective that change a lot if you want to represent the economic part, the scientific, the scientific research part, the teaching part, and so on. Etc. 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 So this is fundamental, not only defining the university, the domain that is university, but also the specific scope of that uh, ontology. In our case, I would say that we can open Word and say that we would like to build. Yes, we would like to build. Um, an ontology whose domain is a university uh, from the educational point of view. So we are not interested in uh, research. We are not interested in administrative. We are interested in students, courses, degrees, uh, teachers, and so on. So for example, we will not uh, we can choose not to represent professor as associate professor, our external professor, full professor, assistant professor, postdoc, and so on, but just as people that teaches, that teachers. Maybe we can say if it's internal or external, but we can in this domain, in this perspective, just to say, okay, there are people that teaches. I don't really care in this case if they are faculty or not internal or not. So the domain is university. The, the point of view of this domain is educational. Let's try to write some competency questions. Just to remind you, the competency question are defined a list of questions that a knowledge base built upon ontology should be able to answer should be able to answer. So this ontology on uh, uh, university educational, which competency question could be able to answer at the end? So I will write the first one and then I will ask you for others. So for example, how many <coughs> professors there are for a certain degree program? This is a competency question. Mm -hmm. In the end, our ontology, the software that run on ontology, the query that we can have on our ontology would like to answer the question, how many professors there are for the Bachelor of Science on Electrical Engineering, for example. Then let's try to write some other competency question. How many students uh, there are? <coughs> For a course in a certain degree. So uh, she said how many students there are for a course in a bachelor degree. It's better to generalize a little bit. So instead of a bachelor degree, a certain degree, where the bachelor is one of these possible degree. Let's write some other. How many courses are teached by a professor? Yes, obviously not teached.
What kind of dig? Okay, so um, can I say which degree a university offer? So they also ca can can be not in form of question, but just <coughs> which degree university offer is obviously not a question, but it, it needs an answer. Then I don't know another one or two. Yes, which courses are part of a given degree? Last one, then we go over. Who? Let's change. Who follow a given course or who teaches? A specific course so, and you can continue if you want to have a bunch of these questions so in the end our ontology should be able to have the notion of you, you already start to to have some concept here some relationship so you have the concept of degree you have the core the concept of course you have the concept of uh, professors and students uh, you have the re some relationship, the course offered by university, uh, university uh, follows a given course, teaches a given course. So you just start to have some concept here, some properties here, and so on. So this is the first step, just to clarify what you want to speak about, what you want to create an ontology about. In this case, university and education, teacher and students. Second step, consider reuse. We will not reuse anything. There are no university ontology in the world, let's say. So, but in some cases, it's super useful to consider the, to the reuse of existing ontologies to save the effort to interact with the tools provided by other ontologies and also to employ ontologies that have been already validated through use in applications. So for example, for, uh, for mm, natural language processing, uh, there are ontologies that determine the semantic of some words and similarity among words and so on. So you can use that for build, on, build your ontology. And for the energy field also, for the sensor data, IoT data, also there are a lot of ontologies, also some pseudo-European standard ontology to doing that. So they are already exist and, and you can use it so you have two types of ontology to be reused typically you have general ontologies also called upper ontologies because they are if you print them they are in the upper part and you below them you specify your ontologies so you uh, create a more specific version starting from that. So there are general uh, ontologies like SIC, like Dolce, that is a descriptive ontology for linguistic and cognitive engineering. So quite wide as a domain as a topic. WordNet for words. But then you maybe you can start from the concept of person that is in Dolce and uh, you may specify that person as a teacher, as a student. So you can refine that. Or you have domain-specific ontologies that are not general, that do not present general concept, but very specific context, like uh, MUO, that this link doesn't work anymore, unfortunately, that is uh, about unit of measure. It defines 
basically all you need to measure in the world, both in the metric system and not in, in the imperial system, and are in ontology. So you need to represent VAT. Here we are. VAT, all the exchange, all the transformation between a uh, given unit to measure and any other unit to measure already represented. So you can use it, for example. Uh, or the gene ontology, that is for gene. Or the GONT, that is uh, well, ontology that we developed a lot of time ago uh, about uh, the smart environment, IoT devices, and so on. So you can choose, you can mix up upper general ontologies with domain specific ontology, you can choose to reuse, to use buffer dam. A portion, maybe you just need the, the electrical part of the new ontology, not everything. And so you can just import them or, or recall it as a link in your ontology if needed. So it's always a good step to consider what exists in the world before starting developing uh, an ontology. In, in our case, in our sample on a university education, we will skip this part for now. We'll skip this part. So second step done. Third step, enumerate important term. So write down a list of all terms, most terms, several terms, uh, you would like to make a statement about or explain to somebody. So three questions in defining this term are what are the terms we need to talk about, what are the property of this term, and what would, what would we like to say about the term. So example as before, student could be a term, which properties we can define for students. And what we would like to say about a given student. We are interested in our domain to the age, maybe yes or maybe no. We are interested in its name, we are interested in how tall he is or she is, his gender. There are properties for a person, perfectly valid, but maybe not in our case, or is average mark could be something that we would like to represent or not. Uh, it, to get started, it's important to get, again, in this case, a comprehensive list of terms without worrying about terms that overlap, relationship, duplicate relationship, possible duplicate relationship, and so on. So while competency questions are not a comprehensive list of question terms should be a comprehensive list of terms. So as before, terms. So let's start doing this. We will not have a comprehensive list today. We will need more time that we have. But let's start creating some term. Terms could be concept, could be properties, could be whatever, no problem. So I would start as before typing university. I would like in our ontology to keep track of the university. So uh, a course, a professor of a course in a degree program at Politecnico Torino. Or the same course at Politecnico in Milano. I, I would like to keep track of university. Then. course professor uh, let's call it teachers in this case uh, student degree degree yeah uh, ah here notice that I keep all the terms in singular. This is not mandatory. You can also have terms and then concepts uh, like universities, courses, teachers. It's perfectly fine. It's up to you. Just don't mix. Choose one of them or all singular or all plural as you want. Then. Uh, 
education level? It's already degree. Okay, it's uh, okay. Degree type, can we call it in this way? Level, then we think about a better name. Then some properties now, just to teach is. For example, is the properties. Also notice that by definition, mm, I use capital letter for concept and not capital letter for properties. And that since uh, terms are singular, verb are in the third singular person. So teaches, a, a teacher teaches a course, for example. Is enrolled in. Is enrolled in. Some other property. Also, sorry. Yeah, it's part of is, yeah, I will read in this way. It's part of, yeah, sub 10. Uh, part of is, say, for free with uh, a well. Name. Name could be. Uh, for student, could be used for the student ID. For example, and um, maybe another one or two. Course ID. Yes, let's move away from ID and names. And um, what, what properties as a course, for example? A student. A student, okay. This course is how long? hours for example yes or if we imagine for a um, bachelor master students in Italy we can also speak about credits hmm? Let, let's say credits hour no hours and course hours so uh, you can continue basically forever so let's stop here just just to have an idea so you have defined some terms pertaining to concept some terms pertaining to relationship between this concept and some term that are instead a property of a specific concept like student id that is not a relationship between two different uh, concepts just a specification a further detail of a one of these terms. <coughs> Perfect. After this step, and we will do all of them in a second moment, you need to define classes in their hierarchy. So a class is a concept in the domain, and not specifically the word, but not a domain. And it's also a collection of elements with similar properties. The instances of classes are instead specific named element that pertain to that collection. So a class is university. An instance of a class university is Politecnico di Torino. Uh, classes usually constitute a taxonomy, hierarchy. We can have, for example, a superclass that is degree and then we can have bachelor degree, master degree, and PhD degree as a subclasses of this. And a class hierarchy is an ontology usually as is a hierarchy. So a PhD degree is a degree. A bachelor of science degree is a degree. A bachelor of science degree is a university doesn't work. So you cannot put a bachelor, of science, uh, bachelor of Science degree as a subclass of university hmm? because it's not a ISA. Hmm? 
Similarly, an instance of a subclass is also an instance of its superclass. This could be used for if you uh, work uh, via software with an ontology or you query the ontology. You can query a superclass and you also get all the subclasses if you want for the instances. Uh, there are, as in many other things, three modes of development of an ontology. This is the top-down, the bottom-up, and the mixed. The top-down define the most general concept first and then specialize them, so university, degree, person, and so on. The bottom-up instead define the most specific, so Bachelor of Science or computer science courses, and move up, or combination of these two methods, so some concept, and then you specify some of that, uh, from some of those concepts, and then you move to other generic concept, and you move back to some specific concept. There is, in, in this context, there is no uh, methodology that's better than the other, in this specific context, because it's a long process. So you maybe start with some generic concept, and you specialize them, and then you discover that you forgot some generic concept or you need to move a subclass from a concept to another and so you mixed up everything in separate way in separate time after defining classes or a first set of classes you can define properties of these classes and you have as we also see in the in the terms you can have Intrinsic type of property, like the color of an object, or extrinsic, like, like the price of an object, or relation to other instance. So something that put together an object with its producer, its manufacturer. And you can have simple properties that is, are called data properties that contains primitive values like strings, number, and so on. So the color is a simple process, a simple property, a data property. The price is, could be a data property. The credit of a, a course could be a data property. Complex property instead contains or point to other object. Like for example, an object is produced by a manufacturer, but maybe the manufacturer is instead a, con is a class, a concept, because it has some other properties like, I don't know, uh, uh, its name, so it has other properties, its name, its location, uh, if it's under in some catalog or not, can have some other, what produce this manufacturer and so on. Notice that before I say that, for example, color could be a simple properties, I say could because color could be also an object with other properties. It depends on the level you need. So for example, you can put uh, the colors, uh, a concept of colors like red and say, okay, red is a primary color instead, uh, or composite color, so you can have a classification of that. It depends on what you need in your specific domain. After describing property, you can define constraint on this property so for example that the name of an object is a string or that Polytechnic Torino is an instance of university and that the university has exactly one location or that a teacher can teach maximum 10 courses some constraint on some of these properties and we refer to this like as a property restriction in terms of cardinality, domain, and range that you already saw last time, right? Cardinality, domain, and range of a, a proper data property, object property. Yes? Okay. Um, as I said before, a subclass inherits all the properties uh, from the superclass. So an instance of superclass is an instance also the superclass. This works also for properties. If you define some property in a superclass, all the subclasses have the same properties. And you can refine them, but not delete them. And if a class has multiple superclasses, it inherits the properties from all of them. 
Yeah, obviously, a superclass can override the restriction to narrow its list. So if a superclass say maximum 10, the subclass could say maximum 5, for example. So make the cardinality smaller or replace a class in the range with a subclass of it. Finally, after defining classes, properties, their constraint, you can create instances. Uh, instances are individual. And so to define an individual, you need to choose the desired class, create the instance of the class and fill the property values that this class, this instance must have according to its description. Notice that some ontologies doesn't have instances. And in most cases, it's not mandatory. Maybe you just want to represent a domain, but not to instantiate anything in particular. And in most cases, uh, you have an ontology with all the classes and an ontology with all the instances in two separate files so that you can reuse the ontology with classes with multiple different instances in multiple set. So you may have the ontology that represents university and have an ontology with the, all the instances of Italian university and then you can have a different ontology with all the instances with UK university and so on. But you have just one ontology with the classes that describe the university from the educational point of view. So to, to sum up this, this part, to create an ontology, the process is seven step, define the scope and the uh, domain of use, the specific domain of use, consider the use of other ontologies, enumerate terms, and com write competency question, define classes, properties, and constraints, and finally, optionally create instances for that ontology. Uh, here the slide reports some possible problem and uh, solutions uh, or things to be to have present. So a class can have more than one superclass, I said before. So you have, it's point of attention that a subclass inherit properties and restriction from all the parents. So if you for example, create a subclass of uh, two disjoint classes, you get trouble because these two classes are disjoint and the subclass cannot be a subclass of both. So you have to take a, make attention of this. Uh, disjoint class are classes that cannot have common instances. They are disjoint. They are two separate things for sure. And they cannot have any common subclass either. Uh, try to avoid the class cycle. This is not the same mandatory, but uh, it's a danger of this multiple inheritance, the cycle and the class hierarchy. So if a class A has subclass B and B is also a superclass of A, the result is that B is the same of A, is equivalent to A. They are the same exact object. They are the same class. And so this is not the, the output that you probably desire. So try to avoid the class cycle, if possible. Uh, all the sibling in the class hierarchy must be at the same level of generality as a description. Hmm? If you want to think about uh, section and subsection in a book. So here you have degree program, you have bachelor, doctorate, and master, because bachelor, doctorate, and master are at the same level of generality. They describe a general uh, degree program. Here you can have bachelor in computer science because it's not at the same level of the doctorate and master. You can have, if you want, if you need, bachelor in computer science, doctorate in computer science, and master in computer science because they have the same level of generality. Similarly, here you cannot have undergraduate student, graduate student, and teacher because undergrads and graduate students are two face it of a general student. So here you can have students and teacher if, if you need to keep track of that, you can have properties of a subclass 
undergraduates and postgraduate uh, post students as a subclass of students, if you want, but not under person. Hmm? Uh, then one of the question is, how many class is too many and how few classes are too few? How large should be the ontology? It's um, a rule of thumb, it's not a, a, strict, a strict answer. The rule of thumb is that if a class has only one subclass, then probably there is a modeling problem. It's too few, just one subclass for a class. Or the ontology is not complete. Maybe the ontology is not complete, and so you have just, just one subclass. So consider in that case to merge the subclass with the general class. And if there are more than a dozen subclasses, siblings at the same level for a given class, then maybe you need to <coughs> add some intermediate to incorporate these subclasses in intermediate objects, a collection of objects, let's say. Um, naming, as I said before, you can choose singular or plural, plural, it's up to you. And when defining domain and range, try to find the most general class or classes for that. So if you can choose person instead of students, go with person and not with student, if you can. An ontology, again, should not contain all the possible information about that specific domain. Again, is strictly related to what you want to model, to, uh, to the application, to the scope that you have in mind for which you build the ontology. Mm -hmm. So you need, there is no need to specialize or generalize more than the application needed. As an example, in, the, in our university ontology, we will not, for example, define a subclass for undergrad and a subclass for postgraduate students because the students is enough for representing who follow a course and who teaches a course and how many students the course has. Uh, similarly, there is no need to include all possible properties of a class. So for students, we probably don't care about its age or its name or its gender or how tall he or she is and so on for our domain. Maybe for a medical point of view, you need all this information because they are relevant. But in our case, not, so we can skip it. Because for a student, it's okay not to have this information in our context. Yes, here we are, have two or three uh, references. And if you don't have a question, or if you have any question, Great. I would like to open Protégé and try to build a, at least a, a portion of this uh, university ontology with you. So let me increase the font. Hopefully, yeah. So, so let's start from the uh, entity tab with classes, sub tab, and let's start to build some concept that we put in our term list. So for example, we can add uh, when you create a new class, you are asked about a name and the, typically the URI is self-generated. So the name, for example, in our case, let's start to create some of these. You have a university, course, uh, we put together teacher students under person and a degree program for now. So let's say university. So you may notice that here you have the entire uh, name of the ontology with its prefix that by default in protege is semanticweb.org slash uh, the, the username of the computer owner slash ontologies slash 
uh, the year slash a number slash the name of an ontology dot of dot of well or not hash hashtag the um, the name of the class so in this case university so we can create uh, the classes and when you create a class you'll see everything empty here so let's continue to this let's can create a um, course a degree program and a person So notice two things. The first thing is that they are uh, written with f in the font that is bold. Things written in bold font are things that are created in this specific ontology. So if we open ontology and import this university person degree program will not be bold as a font just to separate if it's something that you created or something that you imported from other ontology. Hmm? Then, person will have, as we said before, two subclasses, student and teacher. So let's create a subclass. A subclass is created exactly in the same way. So the name is student. And we also have a sibling teacher. Then we can do the same thing for degree program in which we can have a bachelor, master, and a doctorate. And we will not specialize course nor university no subclasses for them. Uh, so right now I put some representative, let's say name as na name of the classes. Classes can be named also one, two, three, four, or whatever you like. Uh, it's not mandatory that they have a specific name some ontologies will not have in the classes realistic understandable name maybe they have p as person because they rely on the annotation so in the annotation if you add a label uh, like a, a person protege is able to in this case you see no difference but protege is able to if you want to display the labels instead of the um, description. That's, in, in this case, there is basically no difference, but maybe if you have a long name, say degree program, a longer version degree program, you can have a label that is degree, space, program, space, and so on. You can have a longer description for this, and you could put it, uh, an RDF label is an annotation, if you want. So, we just created the classes that are the one represented here, university, course, teacher, and students. We put it together under person, degree program, and degree type level we merged together. So let's try to create some of these uh, uh, object properties. Mm -hmm. So now let's start from data properties. Okay. Data properties, another tab. So data properties are simple properties. So for course, we can have, let's say uh, we have here name, it's reasonable, and uh, credits and hour. So we can have course name. Hmm. Notice that here these are not classes, so they are not capital. Uh, let's say um, course credits and course name of hours. 
I prefixed the course for clarity. Here works the same as before, the annotation can be used. And, but for, for example, course name, it's we'll say important to have a difference between course name and person name because they are always name. For hours and credits, probably in this case, we can also use credits if you want. So for courses, well, let's say these three. For a degree program, we can have uh, a degree name, degree name, and stop. For a person, we can have person name, And maybe we would like to keep track if a teacher is a faculty member or not. So we can have a data properties that is faculty. Hmm. While for university, we can have a university name. This can also be put in a hierarchy. Right now there are very few, so we can put it in a list without any problem. So we need to fill up some details here. So for example, let's do it for some of them only. A university name will have a domain and a range at least. So we can say that the domain of university name is university and the range of university name string that in our case we can use a literal that is defined in RDF that is a string basically okay so we can do the same for faculty uh, faculty the domain is teacher why not person? I, I told you before that it's always better to keep the most general, but faculty doesn't not apply to student. So let's put it only in teachers in this way. And our range Boolean. There is a Boolean. Boolean. Yeah. Yes or no? basically uh, we can do if we want the same things for person name degree name that have same domain person uh, range uh, string literal and course hour for example we'll have as domain uh, a course uh, as as a range uh, an integer for example and same things for from the other so data properties are more or less this so we can move to object properties so object properties have some more uh, features here mm -hmm. so object properties for example could be inverse could be symmetric <laughs> and so on so our object properties could be for example, taken from this list. There is one is enrolled in, there is one teaches, there is a tense, and so on. So let's start from uh, enrolled in. So notice that object properties are verb and data properties are nouns instead. Enrolled in, let's fill this already so enrolled in as as domain student a student is enrolled in a course a, a degree program because for course we use follow okay and then we can have for example follow That again, the domain is student, and in this case, uh, the range is course. 
then we can, for example, have the property is 